My job today is to try to create a sense of urgency. So I'm not an urban planner. Um, I'm a muddy boots biologist. I'm a biodiversity, climate change, emerging diseases specialist by training. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do is to give you some context um, from outside of the particular considerations that, that most of you are interested in today. Um, now, we are going to see if I have it. Okay, next slide, please. All right. The first thing we have to understand is that climate change unites humanity in a way that humanity has never been united before. Now that sounds very strange. How can that actually be? Next slide, please. And, that's, and there are two reasons for this. The first is that global climate change is a national security issue for every country. And if it's a national security issue for each country, then it's a national security, it's an international, it's a global human security issue. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. The second is that climate change is literally beyond belief in the sense that none of the human belief systems that we have developed in the last 20 or 30,000 years mean anything. There are no favored groups of people on this planet when it comes to climate change. Next slide. Now there are some reasons for hope. There are some things that are happening that look pretty good. One is that global birth rates are declining. The use of alternative fuels is increasing. Poverty seems to be decreasing, but none of these things are happening very fast. Global health is improving. Uh, at least in the sense of infant mort mortality is dropping around the world, and fresh water is abundant, if not distributed in ways that are appropriate. Next slide, please. On the other hand, there are still a few things that are not going particularly well for humanity and for this planet with respect to climate change, and I'm not going to read that list. Next slide, please. So, having ignored the scientific community since 1896, when the first article was published saying that industrial carbon dioxide emissions were going to warm the atmosphere, humanity is now only being asked one question. And that question is, do you feel lucky? Next slide, please. And the answer, of course, is no. Anybody who feels positive about the future is delusional. We are no longer on what we call the slippery slope of problems. We're past that. And the last half century was a wonderful time compared to what's coming at us more and more rapidly now. Next slide, please. The science is essential for this. And some of you may have seen this. Uh, this it's more important to say this in the United States than the rest of the world, but it's up there. Next, please. All right. Now, climate change is not only a scientific issue, it's primarily a biological issue because we're biological systems. And, and climate change affects us. And it's largely created by things that biological systems, including us, are doing. If it's a biological problem, it's an evolutionary problem because we're, we are part of an evolutionary system. And this is, has some good things and some bad things about it. This is what evolutionary biology promises us. The first thing is that the only sense of sustainability that you can get from evolutionary theory is you're still alive, aren't you? If you survive long enough, it's possible that better solutions will arise evolutionarily, but none of those are ever permanent because they're always contingent on the conditions of the time and the conditions of the time always change. So that means that every evolutionary advance always produces unanticipated consequences. And finally, evolution guarantees us that there are severe limits on growth and that the penalties for those for exceeding those limits may be postponed but they can never be escaped completely 
Now, what's most at risk from our standpoint? It turns out the biosphere is not at risk. Some of our most favorite fuzzy little species are at risk. The biosphere is not at risk. The biosphere is quite capable through evolution of regenerating complex ecosystems even after massive extinctions, primarily because evolution, unlike human beings, never repeats the mistakes of the past. And in fact, the biosphere is already beginning to cope with climate change. And it's not waiting for us to decide whether or not we want to be one of the species that's going to survive. Mother Nature is pretty much indifferent to us because there are a lot of species, and we're just one of them. Homo sapiens as a species is also not at risk because, ironically, because there are so many of us. And we're everywhere. And we're in lots and lots of different kinds of habitats. So some of us are going to survive no matter what the rest of us do to the planet or do to ourselves. So what's really at risk is urbanized technological humanity. Now that sounds really bizarre, right? Because we haven't lost a major city on this planet since the Anthropocene started. So we must have figured it out, right? Well, if we had figured it out, we wouldn't be having this conference. Some of you, all of you, think that something's not quite right with this. Now, what does human evolutionary history tell us about human being, groups of human beings coping with climate change? For most of our history, if we were exposed to climate change, we ran away. If the conditions changed, flee. If you can't run away, do the best you can to try to cope. And if you can't cope, you die. That's, that's human history in a nutshell. It's also all biological history in a nutshell. Pre-Anthropocene urbanized societies have been ex exposed to climate change events before. None of them as extreme as what is coming our way within the next 20 years, but severe nonetheless. And in each case, that civilization was destroyed forever. It never recovered. That's the reason this planet has more abandoned cities than occupied cities. And it's because cities limit our ability to run away from trouble. We've changed our own evolutionary game. This is Sunrise at Anger Wat, a wonderful, beautiful, technologically advanced urbanized civilization destroyed by an inability to cope with just 20 years of climate change. And here are some ways in which our Anthropocene cities have made us vulnerable. They are density and connectivity traps. And in my particular case, one of the things, one of the surprising problems with with urbanized areas is that they're actually wonderful little centers for maintaining disease. We call them parks, green spaces. We've constructed a highly technological niche for ourselves and we are living beyond our means with Scientific community are that if we continue business as usual, the year 2050 will be the end of the 
first thing was I would change and all we were doing was buying some time. And so we lost our advantage. We lost what we could have done. And I 